Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I think this is the last, uh, the last presentation of the day, but not sure. So hopefully we can get some energy into you to close out um, the conference. My name is Melissa Cronin. Um, I am from I'm here local in Charlotte. I've been in Charlotte for, for 14 years. I'm a managing director in our financial services technology practice. Um, and so I focus, uh, my day job is really um, working with financial services clients um, to help them advance and progress their technology agenda. Um, and then my night and weekend job is um, mom and wife to uh, three little girls and, and, a, and a wonderful, hardworking husband. Thank you, Melissa. Yep. Uh, my name is Bob Lax. I am super psyched to go after Alvaro. Um, I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> that you guys all enjoyed that presentation. Uh, it's very, you know, sort of um, heartwarming to sort of hear the journey and, and, uh, and, and, and hear his instruction sort of there at the end. So um, I live in Atlanta. I've been with Accenture since uh, 1987. Um, had a lot of different roles. I spent most of my career in the high-tech industry, um, mostly software companies, computer manufacturers, uh, uh, communications equipment providers. Uh, about seven years in communications, and as uh, they said, I lead the Southeast uh, technology practice now, which is all of our platform business, uh, you know, Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, et cetera, as well as our custom development uh, organization. So we're going to talk to you today about the tech vision. Now, this was going to be a panel. We were going to talk about dark, but we're actually, actually going to go through the, the uh, entire tech vision. Um, and there's time, at questions, uh, time for questions at the end, so uh, we, we, uh, we hope to make it interactive. So you, you saw Paul talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the five trends this year. And just as a little background, um, we've been doing this uh, five trends in technology for over 10 years. I think it's actually like 12 or 13. Um, it's, it's developed by our Accenture Labs organization. You saw Michael on the video. He's one of the managing directors in the labs, and he really drives this vision. Uh, so they spend a the year researching, and then they come out uh, with uh, with the vision uh, each year around February, and they try to they try to uh, sort of track the path of these trends and how things are changing over time. Um, so uh, this year, this is called the uh, post digital era. Now, as Paul said, you know it's not digital is dead. It's not what after digital. Digital is pervasive. So what are the technologies and trends that we're going to see? really help our customers, our clients, you know, companies sort of rethink, re-strategize, um, and try to drive sort of the, the next wave of innovation, you know, with their customers, right? So we'll just sort of walk through these a little bit and um, give you a little flavor and some examples. Um, and again, if you have questions, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask those as well. So um, I think this is the wrong presentation. Oops. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Did they get the one that we sent over last night? Okay. So let's just talk about Dart for a second. Uh, then they'll they'll put up the the, the presentation. Um, so um, Paul talked about this distributed ledger, right? This is really about um, using technology to disrupt third-party intermediaries across all types of industries. And you hear about things like blockchain and cryptocurrency and those sort of things, so the obvious uh, technology advances. Um, but you know, this is really more pervasive than that. And lots of companies are trying this, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the, the A is artificial intelligence in dark. Um, so I would say AI has become almost pervasive. There's almost no project that I see in Accenture now that doesn't have some element of artificial intelligence or machine learning, et cetera, embedded in the project. And I'm, and I'm talking about you know, not just the obvious things like chatbots and digital agents and help and those sort of things, but um, there's actually some work that I've seen some of our teams do around putting AI on top of their software development repository and using that to determine things like, you know, what, what are the most uh, likely modules that are going to have bugs? What are the most likely teams that are going to finish late? And really using that technology for more than, you know, to, to help drive the delivery process. Okay, so the, the uh, oh, we went back to the other one. Um, so the uh, R, ex uh, uh, extended reality, right? So here we're talking about AR and VR um, and, and what you can do with that. And then Q is quantum computing. So this is probably the furthest out of these four trends, but there are a lot of people working on this today. So 
um, um, yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of advancements there. So let me just talk about while they're, while they're working on the presentation, let me, uh, let me talk about some examples. So one example I want to share around dark is Volkswagen, right? So <clears throat> Volkswagen has a lot of different pilots and tests underway, and they're doing things that you might not think are typical for the manufacture of the car. So they're working on things like trying to optimize uh, very complex traffic routes with quantum computing, right? They're looking at, at uh, how to make uh, batteries uh, longer life extended for hybrid cars, uh, as obviously probably most car manufacturers are. Um, they're, uh, they're even driving um, you know, interesting activities around, uh, around car functions and features with, with AI. So there's a number of different things they've got going. All of these I would call are you know, experimentary, right? They're not things that they're going to roll into the car tomorrow, maybe the battery, et cetera, but they're helping position Volkswagen for, um, uh, for you know, being able to provide more innovative products and solutions to their customers as they, as they go on. So <clears throat> next one I want to talk about is LG. Um, so uh, LG is one of the manufacturers, like Microsoft, of, uh, of virtual reality, augmented, augmented reality equipment. And if you use these before, you've noticed that <clears throat> there, you can get a lot of jitter uh, or a lot of sort of uh, 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 jump in the video, and that can cause some people to get motion sickness when they use these devices. It's actually one of the problems that, uh, uh, that, that we have with them. So, uh, LG is uh, partnering with a university in, in South Korea called Soyang University, and they're actually using AI to predict some of the motion elements in the video to remove that jump and remove that jitter so that they can, you know, more people can use them without the emotion sickness uh, effect. This is an interesting one where <clears throat> they're actually using one technology, um, AI, to enable another future technology in VR, right, VR and AR. Um, the last one that I'll share is, uh, <clears throat> is Microsoft. Uh, so Microsoft is partnered with a company called uh, uh, Adentis, and they provide uh, product tracking and tracing software, and they're leveraging a number of these technologies to make that software more effective. So per, per, uh, predominantly AI and blockchain um, around trying to uh, improve traceability, improve transparency, and really locate you know, the products better. So you could see how in this sort of a situation, you could even take the other technologies and extend that further, right? So you could take <clears throat> um, uh, quantum computing and drive out more calculated or more complex routes, and we talked about before. You could take uh, augmented reality and apply that to a warehouse worker when they're picking and tracing products to try to improve the, uh, uh, the effectiveness there as well. So lots of different opportunities to use these technologies. And what we'll do is we'll sort of go through and talk about each trend, and we'll talk about a couple of examples and, and uh, try to bring this to life a little bit. So let me, I don't know if you need this, but if it no, comes online when you... Uh, <laughs> <coughs> um, so the second trend that was referenced was get to know me. And, um, you know, this is really all about how companies are creating these digital identities of their consumers. Um, through what technology that they use and how they use that technology. Um, and I think what's really interesting is it's creating a customer profile that's more intimate um, than they've ever had before. So it's kind of a, it's a very tight line, right? Because there's um, this line between really cool and really creepy, and every consumer has a little bit of a different definition of what that means. So not only do companies have to um, you know, use this technology to get this digital identity, but they also have to know you well enough to know where you fall on that line so that you as a consumer don't think they're creepy and then you know, they're, you know, stop using their business. So um, a couple of examples there. Um, one is a company called SlicePay, which is a lending platform. And what SlicePay has been able to do is tap into a market that typical lenders haven't been able to do by um, basically determining a consumer's credit worthiness through, how, um, through their technology profile. So think about kind of a non, think about somebody that doesn't have a credit score, somebody that doesn't bank through traditional approaches. You know, how do you determine whether somebody in that category is worthy of um, you know, lending or a loan. So traditionally, they just didn't get one. Um, well, what SlicePay has been able to do is um, use their technology profile, 
look at how many times did they go on vacation within a three-month period. Where did they go? Um, how many times did they check into a restaurant, a high-end restaurant in South Park, and you know, pay for an expensive meal? So these non-traditional ways to determine somebody's credit worthiness is what SlicePay is now using um, and creating, basically, being able to lend based on, on that. Um, so, so very interesting. Another example is, and you may or may not know this, but a lot of the mobile payment apps out there only work um, when you have access to Wi-Fi. Um, so there is a big kind of consumer base out there, one that doesn't ever have access to Wi-Fi, but then a lot of us here don't always have access to Wi-Fi. So we're restricted in when we can make these mobile payments. Um, there's a group of companies that has come up with a way to um, still enable you to make a mobile payment through um, a blockchain network, um, through uh, mobile providers, and SMS text. So the customer can now text the transaction. It's authenticated through a blockchain network of mobile providers. And then once approved, that transaction is executed. Um, so now, you know, essentially, you can make a mobile payment. It, it opens up that ability for a broader audience um, and allows you and I um, to make a mobile payment whenever we want. Um, so that's another, um, so that's a good example of get to know me. So this balance between cool and creepy um, and this idi a digital identity that we're all creating out there based on what technology we use and how we use it um, is the second trend. Um, I think we might actually have a slide now. But I don't know how to use the clicker, so. Um. Green. Next Green. slide. Green, OK. There we go. OK, the next, uh, the third trend is human plus worker. And um, this is really, and, and I like this trend because the likelihood of all of us having experienced this trend in the last you know, year um, to two years is, is probably really high. Because this is really about how companies are um, optimizing their workforce through technology. So we all hear kind of the buzzwords around robotics process automation and AI and, and things like that. But how do we um, employ technology within our organizations to really optimize our workforce and the job functions that we all perform every day? And that really you know, starts at kind of recruiting new talent um, coming into the firms. And then once people are here, enabling that talent through various ways. Um, and it really kind of comes down to creating this kind of collaborative culture as well. Uh, so a couple of examples. Um, how many people out here have a question um, and they know that their company has likely answered this question before, but for the life of us can't figure out the expert to go to, where the content lies, so we end up recreating the wheel. I do that all the time and we spend a lot of time doing that. What Swisscom has done, um, they have created this tool called Ask the Brain. And what that does is an employee can go in if they have a question, they type it in this Ask the Brain, and then AI goes out and finds the relevant experts and the relevant content within the company, and the turnaround time is about two hours before that gets produced back to you. So you can take those two hours of time that you would have spent you know, calling 10 people, sending off 20 emails, um, digging through SharePoint sites and discovery trying to find this content towards better use because you know that this brain is finding this um, and likely coming back with probably better answers than you would have gotten through you know, all of those traditional channels of trying to figure it out. Um, Unilever is an interesting one because they're transforming the way that they do entry-level recruiting. And um, I think presentations previously have talked about um, a different type of workforce and how collaboration and the different kinds of skills that we need to be successful in the digital or post-digital era. So what Unilever is doing is um, instead of kind of the traditional resume scans for keyword searches, they actually have a gaming system in place. So their applicants play a game, and then this game kind of scores them on non-traditional skills like collaboration, um, like memory, um, things like, all right, do you, you know, what kind of emotional cues do you take in the workforce? And then an AI solution evaluates all of those and um, makes hiring decisions based on potential. 
Um, so really interesting application of human plus worker here. And then once you get the right workforce in, you know, how do you enable them? Um, I think Accenture actually, Bob, has done a really good job, um, similar to PayPal, of creating this kind of on-demand interactive learning environment where um, the employees have access to content when they need it, where they need it, and in a way that's meaningful to them. So in a way that they're going to be able to grasp the content that they need to be successful. You know, gone are, gone are the days of the traditional kind of log into an LMS site and go click through all of these boring screens and the relevant content you probably, you know, didn't really grasp. Um, and PayPal's done a good job of this as well. And then finally, secure us to secure me. And the way that I like to think about this is you, we really now have to secure the customer experience. We're not just securing our own enterprise and saying that's good enough. Um, because the customer experience is based on an interaction with you, and as well as an interaction with that ecosystem of technology that creates that experience. So it's not good enough to just secure your own enterprise anymore. You really have to secure that experience, which likely is going to mean collaborating with a lot of different companies. Um, so here's some examples. Actually, October of 2018, um, in financial services, they did the first ever um, joint cybersecurity threat activity. So three or four financial services companies, J.P. Morgan Chase being one of them, um, I think Fidelity was another one. They basically collaborated on a, on a cybersecurity exercise where they simulated um, cybersecurity attacks um, on all, all of the firms at once. And what they found was they all approached how they um, looked at and how they controlled or prevented cybersecurity a little bit differently, which created vulnerabilities in the experience. And um, so they're taking now what that's basically told us is, OK, we've got to collaborate um, across our ecosystem to really prevent this experience from being um, threatened. Um, this is an interesting one too. So Strava is a, um, it is a, basically an exercise app that U.S. military wears. And what, so a lot of U.S. military were wearing this, you know, wearable app and tracking their fitness. Um, and the, one of the unintended consequences that they found was the GPS system was um, basically revealing all of these secure U.S. military sites. <laughs> so um, obviously, you know, it wasn't necessarily a threat just to Strava customers, um, but a threat to really, you know, the United States and, and non-Strava customers alike. So these are the unintended consequences that come when we don't think about security in a holistic um, experience way. Um, and so what's come of that? Um, a couple of vendor alliances, nonprofits that have sprung up are between different companies who are all kind of auditing different technology companies in the same way. And they said, okay, well, we need to figure out a way to do this um, across. You know, we need to figure out a way to look at these companies in the same way so that um, we're not creating, you know, these vulnerabilities in our security and then thus a lack of trust in our consumer base. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Have you guys ever seen Accenture people melt down those slides? <laughs> Witness that. <laughs> It's just like we, you know, we're walking like robots. Slides come on, we can talk. Right? <laughs> um, so the last trend is called My Markets, and Paul kind of touched on this in the video, right? So My Markets is about uh, marketing to individuals <clears throat> in a moment and with, with very individualized marketing, right? So we, we've had, you know, with digital uh, consumers and analytics, et cetera, we can do a lot today to really understand those consumers the question is, is how do we turn that into something where we can market to them in a very individualist uh, way, in a moment, um, in a moment that they want to be marketed to, right? So I don't know about you guys, but it sort of bothers me that if I search for something for the next 15 days, whenever I'm on a website, if there's any ads on the website, it's like whatever I search for, it's really annoying to me, right? So how do you start to market to people in a way that, that aren't annoying to them? Just some pretty good examples. 
<clears throat> so there's a company called Paper Boat. I didn't, I didn't mention it. Uh, I mentioned I was from Atlanta. Uh, I have two kids. They're both uh, out of college. Um, one works for Accenture and the other is with the U.S. Navy. So that prior example was very interesting to me. Um, but when my kids were younger, you know, every so often we would have to go to the world of Coke. Who's been to the world of Coke before, right? So if you've been there, you know that like these fountains of Coke spit out and my kids like to get in the fountain and drink the Coke. Um, <clears throat> but you also know that you got Coke from all over the world. And some of that stuff is pretty weird. Well, here's a good example of something that I would call pretty weird, but interesting to the people in this location. So Paper Boat is an Indian-based beverage company. They specialize in buttermilk-based soft drinks. Just sort of let that sit in for a second. Buttermilk-based soft drinks. Uh, I see Alvaro over here is sort of grimacing a bit. Um, so probably not my cup of tea, but apparently it's pretty popular. And what they do is they customize the drink uh, based on the region that they're selling it in by using local uh, additives and local flavorings. So maybe green chili or ginger or uh, curry or something to that effect, right? They also have another soft drink that they only bring out for three days of the year. Um, and it's really mar uh, uh, marketed at a specific moment, you know, for a specific holiday. So you think about how they're, they're customizing this, right? They, they're using WhatsApp to collect preferences from consumers. So they're mining out what people are talking about on WhatsApp, understanding their preferences, right? And then they have a very automated and measured, you know, data IoT driven uh, manufacturing line that they can turn in two to three minutes, depending on what beverage they want to turn. So you can imagine a, if, you, if anybody's ever done any process manufacturing, right, where you're doing, you know, beverage or something to that effect, um, generally the setup of those, of those lines takes a good amount of time and they're able to do it in two to three minutes. So they're able to customize beverages for even special occasions. So if you want to call them up and say, hey, we'd like this particular flavor of buttermilk soft drink, then you know, they could make that for you in small batches and small quantities because the cost of doing so is very small for them, right? So it's a really good example of how you can take this to an extreme. I'm not sure I want to try the buttermilk soft drink. Um, early in my career, I spent some time in uh, communications equipment companies. And this is a pretty prevalent problem because the products are extremely complex and there's lots of different pieces of software that go with these things. So in, uh, Inferion is a, is a telecommunications equipment provider. And before they uh, did what I'm going to tell you about, it took 36 hours for them to quote uh, a particular price or a particular availability date for one of their products. And the reason why is they had to go back and check a lot of different factors, inventory, production scheduling, you know, pricing, et cetera. So they built an AI tool, sort of sit on top of those things that could tell them in real time, what's it gonna, you know, what would this product cost? How quickly can I get it you know, out to the customer? Um, <clears throat> and, it's, and it improved their customer satisfaction and their lost customers. So they were losing a lot of customers. If you think about 36 hours to give me a quote, if there's a competitor product out there, now I've, the customer's got time to go out and find out what that competitor product may be and potentially get a quote from that as well. So they're finding they're closing more customers and they're getting higher customer satisfaction with this. Um, I find this one really interesting. So. The concept of a digital twin, basically a building a, a, a completely digital model of some physical thing. You, you guys might have seen uh, this sort of technology used in our Liquid Studio, for example. We have a, we have a digital tw a twin of a tractor, sort of a uh, toy tractor, not a big tractor. But the idea is, is that all these devices are now monitored and they can affect changes to themselves. You can do it remotely. And so basically showing the ability to sort of manage things, uh, autonomous things in a remote, remote manner. Here in Rotterdam, so this is the second largest city in the Netherlands, the, one of the largest ports in Europe. They've created a digital twin of the entire port. And so when any ship or any uh, container comes into their port, they can see where it is in this digital twin. And by sharing all this data with their shipping partners, people are, you know, the companies that are coming in and out of Rotterdam, <clears throat> they've saved those partners an average of $80,000 per dock. So every time they dock a ship, it costs $80,000 less than it did before they did this, right? So they're actually gearing up to be able to run a completely an autonomous port by 2025. So ships would be autonomously operated, the port would be autonomously operated. You can see where you can go with this and the kind of power that, that would give you. 
So these are some examples of you know, my markets and how they're bringing that individualized marketing in the moment sort of down to uh, you know, their customers. So I think we're ready for questions, and I think there are mics out there someplace. And so if you have a question, throw up your hand and they'll bring you a mic, I think is the way it's gonna work. Um, there's a question here. Ah, there's the mic. How you doing? Um, Dave Morales, IBM. Uh, so a question around, you're talking about the creepiness factor. Mm -hmm. And so there's data protections for individual identity stuff, but like you said, you're also creating a digital footprint of your behavior. Uh, do you see that that's potentially something that's gonna start to get protected and may start affecting some of these services? Mm. Okay. Um, I think, so it's interesting, I was in a, um, at a conference yesterday that was talking about um, regulation. And, and I'm not a regulation expert by any means, but um, what our experts were saying is there's really not a lot, like the regulators don't have their, their minds wrapped around yet, you know, this kind of AI and responsible AI and what do, how do companies respond to that. Um, GDPR, I think, is the first kind of really tangible example where we've seen regulation um, come into play. And it's really the only one that we see of right now. So there will definitely be more. Um, and what our regulation experts say is it's coming. They just don't, they don't have their arms wrapped around it quite yet. I don't know, Bob, do you have any? Yeah, I, I think it's probably going to accelerate. I mean, mm -hmm. Europe really sort of took uh, the first step with GDPR. Yep. And you've seen on the TV, if you've uh, had the stomach to watch the TV lately, um, the just the, the, all the issues with Facebook and the other online platforms and the fact that they're using data and we discovered, I think we always knew, but we sort of discovered factually that the telecom companies are selling location data to those guys and they're collaborating with data sort of behind the scenes and maybe things that they're telling us they're not doing, they're actually doing. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I thought about going and getting a DNA study until Google bought, you know, uh, 23andMe. And as soon as that happened, I said, there's no way I'm getting a study, right? Because if some, a company like that owns like my DNA data, you, you know everything about me, right? So I, I think it's gonna come faster. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of Europe set the stage and so hopefully we'll move on it pretty quickly. Another question? This one over here. You wanna see us just fall apart again? <laughs> Uh, no, this was very interesting. So, um, Warren Gonsalves from Cisco, Cisco Systems. I have a question around uh, the speed, right? It looks like all of these are quite disruptive, and it seems like, based on what I'm hearing, the, it, it's moving fast. So, do you see, uh, has there been a gauge of how disruptive uh, AI and, and some of these secure us, secure me uh, type of initiatives are taking place? Uh, how fast do you see that growing, and uh, and how disruptive do you see that, you know, as far as the world's concerned? Just curious. I don't know that I've seen. So the question was, how fast have you seen some of these things growing? I, I don't know that I've seen like any stats um, about AI specifically in terms of its take up. I think it's been faster than, I mean, AI has been around for a long time. It's just that we really didn't have the computing platforms to sort of make it effective, right? So we've had a lot of the machine learning models around for a long time, the algorithms, et cetera, but, uh, and there's new ones certainly, but we really haven't had the, the computing power. So there's a lot of technologies that have enabled this like cloud and the vendors are starting to make these things available as a service, et cetera, so it's made it go faster. I mean, I, I literally don't see an engagement. Um, I mean, so yes, yeah, so I'm sure there's a few, but but maybe it's because it's so high on people's minds. I mean, they look for ways to leverage the technology now. And the technology is so leverageable. I mentioned the example of the development team that sort of put the Insight engine on top of their source code repository. They actually also integrated it with, uh, with Siri. So the project manager can be driving along down the street and asking like, how many of these things are done? And then the thing will come back and respond. Right? Uh, which of the teams are farthest behind? You know, it'll come back and say these teams. Which of the code sets are you know, gonna experience the most bugs? So you see these kinds of things. And I don't know if you guys have a, an Alexa at home. I, uh, they came out with the, 
the news release, it was yesterday, the day before, that said, yes, Amazon does have like a few thousand people that listen to all this stuff, but they're absolutely promising us that it's all anonymized and they don't know who it is talking. And so it sort of freaked me out because I've hooked up Alexa to like all sorts of things in my house. So it you know, turns on and off the lights, it you know, opens and closes the garage door, it you know, makes, makes the thermosets go up and down. So all these things I think are, these types of technologies are getting more and more pervasive. Um, some of the things that are growing like really fast are things like IoT. Um, so I mean, just the number of sensors that are out there, the number of things that are, I think the latest thing I saw that says something like 23 billion uh, connected devices by 2020 and 75 billion by 2025. So just think about how fast that's growing and the amount of data that's coming in and what you can do with all that. Yeah. Well, if you had uh, no, I agree. I mean, I think that there's not a lot of companies that we work with and, and truly companies that we interact with and collaborate with in life that aren't using at least one of these trends today. And they may not be as, um, you know, front and center as some of the examples that we, um, that we talked about today. But, you know, I was talking to my mom the other day and she said, oh, I typed something into a website and it gave me an answer. Well, yeah, that's, that's a likely, that's likely a, a robot, right? Mom, that's a robot. Um, and so I, I think that it may not be like some of these, you know, far-aged virtual reality things, but most companies are using this technology today in some way, shape, or form. We may not even, you know, know it or realize it because it's a natural way that we're interacting with them. Think about how that's changed. My, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. Think about how that's changed sort of how you interact because right. like when I was a kid, you, we were watching a show and Alec Ball was on. I said, how old is Alec Ball? And, and you know, 10 years ago, we would have sat and gone like, I think he's this and I think he's that. And we would have ended the story or end the discussion not knowing how old Al Alec Baldwin was. But I said, like, how old is Alec Baldwin? She pulls out her phone and goes, how old is the actor Alec Baldwin? It comes back with a number. Like, it's, it's so integrated into, you know, everything we do every day, right? And you don't even realize how, how integrated it is. Erica's a good example in financial services, you know, if all of us, if you're a Bank of America customer, you know, things like that. I think, a lot, you know, it's, it's more prevalent than I think, you know, we realize at the surface. Hi, um, Evan Rodriguez at, uh, with Microsoft. And, and I have a question regarding ethics. Have you and your team considered working with a university, given that the resources required and the insight required, right, the training required, to address a lot of the ethical things that you're probably gonna see. For example, the creepiness may turn into le legal stuff that mm -hmm. then you are confronted by, and the, what do I do with this? I'm a project manager, right? Uh, and the other one is uh, in, in ethics in terms of uh, when you see a, a doc, right, being wiped out completely. Uh, the workforce is no longer, and it's projected, right? Do you have a, a responsibility, right, to work with the, with the team that is in there, right, to get them retraining at the end. Guys, this is coming in five years, heads up. Things of that nature are, are things that are not present, right, uh, when, when you're planning to do these things, but have a real impact on people. And, and, and deep, deep uh, issues that it raises in terms of legal implications and all that. I'll take the first part of that. Um, so last, one of last year's trends was called ethical AI, and it was about exactly what you're talking about. You know, just sort of, there, there's sort of bias in, you know, in everything we do, in all people. Um, Accenture, we have these sort of bias. Uh, they're actually at Harvard, we, we use them, but basically you, you go and take the test, and you sort of, uh, it asks you different things, and there's different, way, different tests that you can take to determine your bias towards different things. So, you know, we realize that every, everyone has biases. So we, we and, and the fact that you, that the AI operates off the data that we feed in, and the data, you know, could be biased as well, we actually launched, and this is sort of one of the things that happens off of these trends, is last year we launched a sort of uh, the data group which essentially is about how do you uh, make sure that your data is not biased feeding a lot of these models, right? And so they develop tools and techniques to drive bias out of the data. And it's absolutely something that's you know, very important. And it was because the labs guys started seeing this stuff and created the trend and then that you know, sort of filtered into the practice and said, yeah, okay, well, how do we deal with that? Well, we need to go create a, a team and a task force to sort of drive that sort of thing. The second part, if I remember, I remember was about um, basically robots replacing jobs, yeah. essentially, or AI replacing jobs. 
I, I don't know if you had anything. I well, the perspective that I have on that is, um, and, and what Paul says actually is, um, dirty, dark, and dingy. So the jobs that are 3D is dirty, dark, and dingy are the ones that are likely to get displaced. I think um, the, the, the job functions outside of that, I don't know that we've seen a lot of displacement yet um, in other job functions, but from my perspective, and this is kind of personal and um, you know, being local to Charlotte and, and knowing some of the um, economic mobility challenges that our you know, city here is facing, it, it, it is an ethical issue that, that we need to figure out how to address. Because the dirty, dark, and dingy jobs, right, are the jobs that, um, you know, a lot of that displacement is going to impact their ability to, you know, have a family-sustaining career, quite, quite frankly, right? So it, it definitely is, um, I don't know that I have a good answer, but it's definitely something that needs to be addressed from an ethical standpoint outside of those jobs. And, and you know, some of the clients, a lot of the clients that we've worked with that have implemented, um, you know, robotics or, or AI or machine learning. Um, I haven't seen a lot of displacement. I know that we, we have also implemented that Accenture to our own workforce um, and have been able to kind of, you know, shift that work elsewhere, not necessarily displace workers. But, yeah, the, the 3D jobs, I think um, we got to figure out how we reskill or, or replace them, you know, fast so that there's not a population of people that are unemployed. Uh, just to sort of add to give you a sort of a scale of the things you're talking about internally. So uh, one group of Accenture we call the operations uh, business is basically the business process outsourcing for our, our clients. And <clears throat> over the last three years, by implementing different uh, RPA and AI tools, and we sort of call it virtual agents, et cetera, we've actually increased the productivity of about of a 100 and 90,000 person workforce by 40,000 people. And we didn't let anybody go. Because what we figured out is there are a lot of jobs you got to do when you've, when you've robot powered all this stuff that were different than the jobs you did before. So instead of somebody actually you know, processing a transaction, the bot does that, but you have to have somebody to train the bot and make sure things are running and all that sort of thing. So it sort of has shifted uh, an upskilling of the workforce, right? Now we were in a period of pretty, pretty high growth. So that you know, we didn't have to lay anybody off. We were able to sort of shift them into different roles and continue growing and adding more work. Um, I could see maybe a different scenario if you're not in a growth you know, industry, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it more important to make sure that we're sort of bringing the society along as your you know, point along the way. And especially if you can sort of think about in your community, if you're not getting these kind of skills early on, you know, there's sort of a point where it's like too late to catch up, right? A, there, there is a book called The Fourth Industrial Revolution by the leader of the World Health Organization. Yep. Very interesting if you can read it. Very thin, but very insightful in, in terms of the disruption that all these technologies are going to create. And one of them is that the politicians have not caught up with it. And so there is not an understanding of, of the impact and, the, and the, the real implications of all these uh, technologies and how politics, right, all sectors of society have to collaborate to address the problem because yep. it's a big problem and, and, and it's impacting us as we go. In this room, we see and hear about the, 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 the disruption coming, but a lot of places don't have this kind of uh, insight, right? Access to this kind of thing. And, and if it's not through a, a, a broader uh, channel, then people don't get to know about these things. They don't get to retrain so that they can take over those jobs you just mentioned. And things like that are hopefully, uh, business can can take a look at how to bring those sectors along. So yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with you. I also think it's a, there's a community effort to it as well. I mean, in, in several of our offices, we have, um, so we, our Accenture sort of corporate uh, uh, giving moniker is called Skills to Succeed. So it's about, you know, helping de people develop skills to help them survive in sort of today's workforce. And so a lot of it is around this. I'll just give you one example of uh, one thing we're doing in Atlanta um, is we're actually working with, um, it's, the, it's the poorest zip code, lowest income zip code in, in, the, in Georgia. 
uh, working with uh, some community partners to do some STEM training at like the sixth, seventh, eighth grade level. It's sort of because if they come out of that, th that level, right, they come out of that age group and they get into high school, there's lots of things to distract them. And if you don't capture their imagination early, then it you know, becomes a problem and it puts them even farther behind. So we were teaching them how to code uh, on a Raspberry Pi and how to do some rudimentary circuit boards, lighting up some Philips Hue lighting and stuff like that. So it's really interesting to see how, uh, how passionate they get about it, you know, only being like sixth grade. I think there was another question if we're, we're out of time. Can we take another one? I saw another one. No. Okay. We're getting the axe in the back. <laughs> so thank you all. We thank appreciate you. it. Um, we'll keep you out to the close. <laughs>